This week, pastors and deacons in our Southwestern Washington Synod began our annual Bishop's Convocation. The theme of the Convocation this year is Act Now to End Racism. So we are doing some learning and some work together as rostered leaders to help take our church in a direction of being more actively anti-racist. Now the impetus for exploring this topic this year, as you might guess, is due partly to the widespread protests following George Floyd's death last summer and the attention that that movement brought to our need to be more deeply engaged in anti-racist work. But it also comes from statements and commitments made by our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America to be a part of this work. Those commitments predate George Floyd's death and the movement of this past year. In some ways, they have always been a part of our church, but we saw the need to make them a more real and organized part after 2015, when a white ELCA Lutheran man walked into the black Mother Emmanuel uh, AME church and shot nine people, including two of whom had been students at ELCA seminaries. So you see, it wasn't any one thing that brought on this topic this year. <clears throat> The topic of our convocation is the result of a lot of little things all piling up and the way our denomination and our synod are growing in response to those things. At the first day of this convocation, our keynote speaker, Stacy Kitahata, began introducing to us the key concepts and practices of anti-racist work. I then attended some workshops, one on the discussion around racial reconciliation and reparations in our denomination and another listening to Song Su and Jenny Kim, who serve Light of Grace Lutheran in Federal Way, as they describe their experience as South Korean immigrants with racism and racial identity in the Lutheran Church. Much of the information and the ideas were review for me. I've been exposed to a lot of this material before. But this week, as it does every time I am exposed to this, this discussion left me wondering about my role as a straight, white, <clears throat> cisgendered male and a pastor in the whitest denomination in the US. What is my role in this work? To what is God calling me in this? How do I take the next step in this important work for anti-racism, not just in this church that I love, but in this country that I call home? Questions like these are daunting. It's hard to think about what big things I'm capable of doing and what I should be or could be doing and whether or not those things will be helpful to the overall conversation. Not only that, there are other conversations just as large and just as important that I feel very passionately about. Things like working for the full acceptance and equality of LGBTQIA uh, folks, both in our church and in our culture or working to alleviate poverty and hunger. One of the big things on my mind right now is how I can help people deal with and overcome that sense of polarization and division that is so prevalent in our nation right now. And how does that fit with these other big things, especially when it comes to anti-racism work? How do you talk about unity and racial reconciliation uh, while also condemning uh, racist systems. It's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. And in the midst of all these big questions, I am particularly grateful for this gospel story this week. Jesus comes to Galilee and he utters the very first words we hear him speak in Mark's gospel account. He says in essence that the old way of things is over, that the new thing God is doing is now at hand. So repent. Rethink everything you think you know, realign all your priorities, and get ready for what God's doing. No big deal, right? The next part of the story is a demonstration of what that looks like. He walks past Simon and Andrew, who are fishing, and he says, Hey, follow me. And they leave their nets and they follow him. Now, they're not just leaving behind property. They're leaving behind a means of support, a way of life, an identity as fishermen. 
And the same thing happens again with James and John. Jesus says, follow, and they leave their father in the boat with his head spinning. That's what repentance looks like. Have you ever imagined yourself in this story? Have you ever wondered if you could do what those first disciples did, just up and leave everything at a moment's notice when some stranger walks by and says, follow me? It becomes even more incredible when you remember where they're following Jesus, right? They don't know it yet, but we all know that the journey will take them through Galilee and Samaria, to Jerusalem and to Calvary and to the tomb, and eventually beyond. Knowing that, do you think they, do you think you would be so quick to follow? But that's what I appreciate about this story today. Jesus has big plans, yes. He knows where he is going, even if these, don't, even if these poor fishermen don't yet. But they don't need to know. Jesus doesn't say to them, hey, I'm going to go uh, teach for a couple years and then get arrested and executed by the Romans, rise from the dead, and then send you all out to the four corners of the earth to spread the news. You in? No, he just says, follow me. And they step out of their boats and leave their nets, not knowing what's next. Although that first step is definitely incredible, it is, nevertheless, just the first step. One of the themes in Mark's gospel is that every day of their journey, these disciples are making decisions about whether and how to take the next step. Sometimes they make good decisions, sometimes not. Sometimes both at the same time. Simon Peter here is going to rightly identify Jesus as the Messiah and then immediately display he has no idea what that means. These disciples are going to fail more often than not on this journey. But that's not the most important part of the story. The most important thing is that for all their missteps and blunders and even their outright betrayals, like with Judas, Jesus constantly, consistently sticks with them, always guides them to the next step. If this story teaches us anything, it teaches us that following Jesus isn't the end goal of Christian life. It's the beginning. It's the basic premise. It's just the setting. In other words, you can't just accept Jesus into your heart and be saved and call it good. The Christ always calls us forward, always calls us to take the next step. He doesn't ask these people to commit to Calvary on that day on the shores of the sea, but he does ask them to step out in faith, to take the first step, and then the next step, and then the next. Discipleship, repentance, even baptism, these are all processes. They're not one-time decisions or singular events. They're all processes that require us to have faith, not in a destination or a goal or a desired outcome, but in the one leading us. You might think about how impressive it is that these four men just left behind everything they knew to follow, but judging from the rest of Mark's gospel, these guys are anything but impressive. They're more often characterized as well-intentioned, but bumbling, ignorant, and short-sighted. What's really impressive in this story is the one who can say a single word, follow, and get four fishermen to just follow him all the way to Calvary. That's the level of impressive stone shown in the story of Jonah, for example, of a God who can send a prophet who doesn't even want to be there to this major cosmopolitan imperial capital and bring the entire city literally to its knees in repentance. In the midst of big questions about vocation, that's my focal point. I can only keep my eyes on the one who's calling me. If I try to think too hard about the big goals and which direction I need to go and how I'm supposed to make all these substantial changes to a world that's so much bigger and more complex than me, I'm gonna get vertigo. I'm going to get dizzy and fall down. 
All I can do is trust Jesus. I trust the one who first called me on this journey. All of these big questions are important to me because they're important to him. Because I know in my heart of hearts that the good news that he asks me to believe is not just for me. It's not just for people who look like me. It's for everyone. It's for black and white, queer and straight, hungry and full, rich and poor. I know that it's not just good news for straight, white, cisgendered folks like me. And I see that, at least in our denomination, that's mostly who's hearing that good news. And I know that there's room for us to grow there and a need for us to proclaim that good news in a way that other people can hear and receive that message. I know that that is important to Jesus. And so I trust that whatever my next step will be, he will guide me so that it's a step in the right direction. So I shared with you some of the big questions on my mind these days. What are the big questions on your minds? Where do you see room to grow for yourself or your church or your nation or your community? Where do you think Jesus might be leading you? To be a Christian is to be willing to engage with these questions because as we see today, Jesus doesn't bring us to Galilee to leave us there. He's constantly calling us forward to Jerusalem, to Calvary, to the tomb, and even beyond. We don't have to know all the steps along the way, but I think we are always invited to be thinking about where that next step will take us. So what is your next step? To what thing is God calling you next? It could be big or little. Maybe it's to get to know a neighbor or to get involved in a community program or to sign a petition or get on a mailing list or to vote. Maybe it's to increase your generosity or take up a spiritual uh, practice or commit to an act of service. It's probably not to quit your job and become a missionary on a different continent, but who knows, maybe it is, I don't know. Whatever it is, that next step is not the final destination. It's just the next step. Once you take that one, there will be another, and another, and another. In grace, God calls us wherever we are, wherever we happen to be in any given moment. But also by grace, God doesn't leave us there. God is always inviting us to grow in our faith by practicing it, by stepping out in it, by leaving our boats and our nets and following, by taking that next step, trusting that it's bringing us in the right direction. Each of those little steps is an opportunity for us to see God at work, to experience the good news of God for ourselves. Never mind where God is calling you ultimately. Think about where God is calling you next, where God is calling you for now. Tomorrow, maybe God will call you somewhere else. Every step taken in faith brings us closer to Calvary, even if it looks like we're headed towards Samaria instead. Eventually, we'll be able to look back at all those steps we've taken and see how Jesus has been there the whole time, leading us to where we are, helping us become the people we are. That's what I see this year with our bishop's convocation. And then comforted with that knowledge that Jesus is still leading us, we're ready to take that next step, and the next, and the next, knowing that wherever we might go, we are headed for God's kingdom.